I've, I've texted you this photo at some point. <laughs> yes, absolutely. This is looking out the windows toward the Torrey Pines State Beach on the Breeze 101 bus. It's ah. like one of the most beautiful bus routes we have in North County. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Hey, Anthony, how are we doing? We have a quorum, sir. Oh, board chair Essen just joined once. Okay. Chair Edson, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Apologies. I kept getting redirected, telling me that I was lost, <laughs> lost in Zoom land. Um, so here we are. Okay. We do have a quorum, ma'am, if you want to get started. Okay, thank you. my agenda up here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. At this time, I would like to call the regular board meeting of the North County Transit District for February 17th, 2022 to order. To begin, we would like to inform members of the public who may be viewing this meeting on the district's YouTube page that in order to make a public comment during the meeting, you must connect to the meeting using the Zoom link provided on the agenda. In addition, you must register to speak by sending an email containing your name and or phone number and the agenda item on which you wish to speak to clerk at nctd.org. Anthony Flores, clerk of the board will now call the roll. Yes, ma'am. Board member Rodriguez. I am here. Thank you, sir. Board member Hinsey. Here. Board Member Contreras. Present. Board Member McNamara. Here. Board Member Desmond. Board Member Gasoline. Here. Board Chair Edson. Present. Board Member Jenkins. Here. Board Member Acosta. Here. That is the roll call, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member McNamara, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, certainly. Uh, please rise and face the flag and repeat after me. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Anthony, will you now provide a safety brief and review evacuation procedures? Yes, ma'am. For those of us in the building, in the event of an emergency, I'll dial 911. In the event of an evacuation, please exit the building using the stairs. Do not use the elevator. Once cleared of the building, please do, please do not re-enter unless told to do so by emergency personnel. We have fire extinguisher, extinguishers and fire alarms located on each floor of this building and a port portable defibrillator located on the first floor. We also have staff on hand trained on CPR procedures. That concludes my safety brief, ma'am. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, ma'am. We had one change. This was sent out to the board and made available to the public. Agenda item 16 was pulled by staff and deferred to a future board date to be determined. Uh, the materials were provided to the board and the public. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is public communications. Anthony, have we received any public comments and do we have any public speakers today? Yes, ma'am. We received a number of written comments. Those were also provided to the board and made available to the public. We have three registered speakers to speak at this time. First up will be a Ms. Shirley Weiss, followed by Al Tarkington, to be followed by Karen Lair. Thank you. Please call the speakers. Ms. Weiss, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You have three Thank minutes. You. Thank you. My name is Shirley Weiss. I live in Del Mar. I'm a constituent of the NCTD and a taxpayer. I've practiced law in San Diego for over 40 years, mostly defending boards of directors in litigation. I attended the January 20th regular board meeting. Uh, I know the board is very influenced by your staff's opinions. Permit me to give you a different perspective. 
I'll focus on the upper bluff and the STB action. First, uh, board members Jenkins and Contreras commented that since other cities had signed license agreements, it wasn't fair that Del Mar get different terms. But this is not a cookie cutter, one size fits all situation. Del Mar situation is fundamentally different from the other cities because the risk created by the railroads on the bluff and the topography of the right of way uh, is fundamentally different. The agreement should not should be reasonably tailored for each city's differences, not co cookie cutter. <clears throat> Turning to the upper bluff, the NCTD offers to license the trail that walkers and scenic view lovers have been using for 100 years, which NCTD got for nothing, uh, if we will allow drilling a fence that will eliminate most of the trail. Mr. Krantz compared the trail to the Cardiff Trail, but Delmar's upper bluff is nothing like the Cardiff Trail, which is a wide trail allowing people and bikes and is not situated on a fragile bluff. In contrast, there is no room for a fence on the upper bluff without eliminating most of the trail. That's why the staff never produced drawings superimposing the fence on the upper bluff to scale. You'd be able to see that. You should visit the site. You cannot erect a fence south of Fort Street without eliminating the trail on the upper bluff. That's because the NCTD took five feet of width for the drainage culvert. And that leaves only four feet wide trail and less than about two feet of vegetation. So in that section, you may be licensing a trail, but the fence will eliminate it. North of uh, 4th Street, fencing the upper bluff um, north of 4th Street will eliminate most of the trail. There, the culvert installed by NCTD was expanded to over seven feet, leaving only six to eight feet for the trail. The west edge of the trail zigzags in width. A linear fence would have to be placed some distance from the west narrowest point of the trail. The fence would thus eliminate most of the trail from public access and reduce it to single file. So unlike Cardiff, the fence seconds. eliminates uh, the walking path. Let me turn to the STP action. Um, uh, board member Jenkins asked the important question about what's the impact of the STB action of Ms. Winfrey. And she simply responded with the NCTD's official position that it just confirms power you already have. But if the NCTD had that power, why did you get an unequivocal letter from the attorney general warning that the NCTD is in violation mm -hmm. of California law and in breach of the grant agreement uh, funding its projects. I urge you to get a separate legal opinion by lawyers that are not connected with the railroads. You were elected to represent your cities. The STB action has a severe impact on the cities for the future long after you serve on the board. You're entitled to a separate opinion. You're entitled to have NCTD pay for it. Please get that separate opinion. It will show you that the impact of uh, the STB action really for generations is going to be severe and adverse to your cities. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Mr. Tarkington, can you hear us? Right. Uh, so I'm on. All right. Uh, so I'm Al Tarkington from Del Mar, and uh, I'm here today to start a conversation about pedestrian beach and bluff access in Del Mar, and primarily about the pedestrian crossing at 11th Street. By my estimates, there are over 70,000 crossings by pedestrians every year at 11th Street alone to watch the sunsets or to get down to the beach at 11th Street's famous surf break. Next slide. The path to the beach at 11th Street was created in 1885, and it has been in continuous use for over 130 years. People have been crossing the tracks at 11th Street since the tracks were moved down to the bluff in 1910. Your modified fence layout, map six of 15, clearly shows the existing track across the tracks and down to the beach. It also shows a six foot planned fence that will block that pathway to the beach. Next slide. The solution is an at grade safe pedestrian crossing at 11th Street and possibly other access points. The district has numerous safe at grade crossings. Here are two crossings on the Sprinter Trail. 
I'm not around, uh, aware of any incidents in connection with these crossings. And of course, there are many at grade crossings where pedestrians are crossing adjacent to vehicle crossings in the district. Next slide. And here are just two of several pedestrian crossings at the San Clemente Coastal Rail Trail. San Clemente and Metrolink have years of experience and years of statistics. It would be useful to contact Metrolink and San Clemente about their experience. Also, there is new modern technology that can make at grade crossings even safer than ever. So I'm asking you to work with the California Coastal Commission and the city of Del Mar to retain over 130 years of public beach and bluff access at 11th Street. Thanks so much for your time and interest. Thank you, Mr. Tarkington. Anthony, could you please call the next speaker? Yes, ma'am. Karen Lair, are you with us? Ms. Lair, can you hear us? I can now. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You have three minutes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Karen Lair. I'm a resident of Del Mar. I'm a taxpayer uh, in this city and in the state. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate your attention to the presentation. I want to make sure that I talk today about the fences on the bluff in Del Mar. The fencing that you're proposing to put in on the upper and the lower bluff, for the most part, um, it'll do a lot more damage than good. Next slide. I wanted to, before I started talking further about that, though, I wanted to thank you for your continuing dialogue with the city of Del Mar and the Coastal Commission. I believe that a negotiated solution can be found. I believe that everyone has the same goal of keeping residents and visitors safe. The trains in the city have been able to coexist for a very long time and can continue to do so. 130 years history of working together to keep people safe on this bluff is not something that should be thrown away and put behind barricades and fences. Next slide. We don't need fencing along the bluffs. It's very dangerous to put them in. The fencing that you're proposing and putting in is adding a lot of additional weight to the bluffs. And as you know, the Delmar Bluffs are fragile sandstone. The three foot wide post holes filled with concrete will cause more damage than you think, both with structural integrity and water intrusion. Post holes will call it, cause additional erosion and the erosion concerns on the lower bluff are really about the safety of the trains and the passengers on those trains. The erosion concerns on the upper bluff are not about the trains and about the tracks. They're really about the safety of the homeowners and their property. And a fence, whether it is a six foot fence or a four foot fence, the post holes for either of those that you're proposing to put in will cause a tremendous amount of erosion um, happening by digging, just digging those holes in the sandstone. Next slide. So what can you do? If you're concerned about safety, what can you do? You can work on strategic fencing only where absolutely necessary. I know all of you are, are smart people and you see the statistics and 80% of the train strikes in Del Mar are close to the 15th street crossing. They're not on the upper bluff. They're not on portions of the lower bluff, bluff that you are proposing to fence. And so I would encourage you to add, again, do strategic fencing only where it's absolutely necessary to focus on those areas. Add warning lights and bells for approaching trains at popular crossing locations. Add additional signage on the lower bluffs. There are very few signs on the lower seconds. bluffs that warn about an tr active train. Slow the trains down, help encourage and facilitate safe crossings. Next slide. Leave the upper bluffs to the city of Del Mar. Don't spend your money on fencing that's not needed and will not help your safety record. Again, no one has fallen off the upper bluff in Del Mar and the trains don't run on the upper, upper bluffs. So the fencing that you're proposing to put on the upper bluffs in Del Mar does not do anything for the trains, for near misses, strikes. Without an in-depth geological study of the specific fencing area, you are risking causing severe erosion all along the upper bluff. Why run that risk? Next slide. Ms. Lair, your time is up. Thank, Thank you. I want you to rethink your strategy. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your presentation. Anthony, do we have any additional speakers? We do not, ma'am. Okay, then um, at this time, we'll end the public registration to speak on this item. Before we proceed, I have two quick items of protocol to share. 
First, I ask that board members please hold comments and questions until after each agenda item has been presented. And second, when the time comes for board members questions and comments, please use the raise hand function and wait until you're called upon to speak. Thanks. We have 10 items on the consent agenda today. Anthony, have any members of the public requested any items be pulled? Not to be pulled, ma'am. We do have two public speakers um, requesting to speak on agenda item four, the quarterly safety report. Okay. Um, are there any uh, board members who wish to have any items pulled? Uh, Chair, this is um, Terry Gasterland from Del Mar. I, I do have questions about items three, five, and eight in addition to item four. Um, I could ask my questions and then they stay on consent or we could pull them and I can ask them at that time. Either way, your discretion. Um, let's go ahead and have you ask your questions if, if they're brief. Um, right now and yeah. uh, then move to consent. Okay, I'll ask the questions and you can, you can decide. All right, so on item number three, this is the monthly operations report. Um, we, in that item, there is a chart that shows that the breeze is underperforming by just about 2.1%. The coaster is underperforming by 37.3% and the sprinter is outperforming its expectation by 7.2%. And so my question is, um, why are the breeze and the sprinter strong while the coaster is weak? Do we have an analysis of that? Um, Chair, I can address that. Thank you. Um, that's just reflective of the different modes um, and the intended purpose and service that they uh, provide. Um, the breeze bus uh, system, um, a ridership um, is where it's at primarily due to the fact significant portions of the population are transit dependent riders. The coastal ridership is still down because a significant portion of the ridership um, was focused in on uh, peak period travel uh, to major destinations between Oceanside and downtown San Diego. With remote working being in place, a lot of that ridership is, um, is lost until folks return to work. If you were to look at a detail of the weekend, you see a better recovery on the weekend because people are starting to go out more and more. So that kind of explains the difference. The Sprinter is a perfect blend in the sense that it, it supports major destinations that were formerly uh, serviced by bus routes, now being provided through di uh, diesel multiple unit services. Thank you. Um, in attachment 3A of the performance report, the coaster weekday boardings are 1,337 per day, and the sprinter are an average of 3,562 per day. Are you keeping the data of how many, at each station, how many boardings there are at that station and how many exits there are at the station? Is it possible to get that? So that could be a very interesting profile of usage. Yes, we do have information about ridership by station. Great, so maybe I can work with you offline on taking a look at that. Yes, ma'am. Great, all right, so for number five, which is finances, um, on page 12 of the staff report, there are fair ratios. And these are the ratios of revenues to expenses. And really what it is, is what proportion of expenses are covered by revenues. And what's in that table is we see that operating costs are going up by $4 million per year for basically the overall services. So in 19, 2019, the operating costs were $86 million. 2020, it was 90 million. 2021, it was 94 million. And if we take the 2022 first quarter results and multiply that by four, we're hitting 96 million. And the ratio is more or less, if we discount the COVID underperformance, um, about 17% of revenues cover the costs. So I'm wondering why are the operating costs going up 4 million per year when they were steady prior to 2019? Well, um, I can address that again, Chair, and Yoon is on and she can get into more detail. But each year is a different year. Fuel prices um, have grown dramatically over time. 
Um, we make different investment uh, decisions each fiscal year. I know for the current fiscal year and, and likely for the next proposed fiscal year, we're gonna be spending more money to make investments to support future ridership and revenue growth. Um, there's also positive train control, which is transitioning from something that was a capital project being fully moved into our operating budget. So from year to year, you have these different variations and fluctuations of activities that take place. Um, uh, all of that kind of is trued up when the board approves the budget, that information is made available in terms of what are we proposing as the expenditure plan on an annual basis. You and I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Yeah. Um can, can, can I be heard clearly? I had some problems the last time around. I can hear you, but you're, you're, you're barely visible. <laughs> um, I'm in my office. I'm sorry. I don't know how to make it better. I think that's what you're on my office. Okay, maybe if I move it a little bit. That's better. better. That's good. Um, other costs that have also increased significantly are associated with our purchase transportation contracts. The, uh, our operating budget over around 60% of our costs is associated with the rail and bus contracts, and those are subject to CPI adjustment. So that means based on where inflation is, obviously we are capped at 3%, but the last three years we have faced increases just on those contracts between 2 and 3%. And the other significant increase that we also have in our costs were associated with liability insurance due to the uh, market conditions on uh, insurance rates. Great, thank you. Um, so on page 17 and 18 of the finances staff report, there are several graphs that show the ridership. And if you look at the left side, the black line, it shows that the breeze is up this first quarter of, of 2022. Um, the coaster is continuing to go down and the sprinter stays flat. And um, Chair uh, Executive Director Tucker, I think you already answered the question there, which is, you know, what is driving those trends? Because there are three very different trends for the different services. I think you answered that already in my question about number three. So thank you. Um, number eight is a request. So that is the $15 million contract to BNSF for signal improvements. And it's phased in five parts. Um, Del Mar slash Encinitas is phase four. So first I'll ask, there's no timing or timeline on this $15 million item, how many years is the $15 million going to be expended over and how much time is given to each phase? I can answer that question. Um, the um, funding for this has a requirement to be spent within 36 months okay. from the time of allocation. So um, the funding for Carlsbad has already been allocated um, for um, the San Diego crossing and Encinitas and Del Mar crossing that's not been allocated yet, um, but is um, we're looking to have that um, be done um, in, uh, I believe in May, um, which we, means we're putting in our packages by March. So um, if the board approves this item, then we can complete our, our funding package for allocation. And then there's within uh, 36 months that we have to complete that, but we feel that um, this work can um, be um, executed probably well within the 36 months. Okay, so phase four Del Mar Encinitas is certainly sorely needed because those crossings are where incidents are happening. Is there a way to prioritize that or is that gonna be fourth in line? Right now we do have it um, from a prioritization of need and, um, and where we most need to get the work done first. Um, but again, these, these projects are gonna move really pretty quickly. And so there should be even overlap between phases three and four. Okay, good. So, so there might be some moving forward. Yeah, my request would be to seek to prioritize Del Mar and Encinitas crossings. So, okay, and then item number four, safety. Um, I have some questions about definitions. In that oh, item report- Excuse, excuse me? Yeah. Um, Shall we pull number four? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you you mentioned uh, having a couple of brief comments on three, five, or questions three, five, and eight. Um, yeah. My intention is to pull item four since Perfect. we have okay. speakers okay. on that. Good. So um, at this time, uh, 
So my, my questions are answered. Thank you much, Chair. Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so to the board, we have, um, as mentioned, 10 items on consent today. Uh, we have item four, which there's interest in pulling by uh, board member Gasterlin and also some comments from uh, members of the public. So um, with that in mind, uh, seeing no extra hands raised for questions, may I have a combined motion to approve the minutes for the special and regular board meetings of January 20th, 2022, and today's consent items one through three and five through 10. So moved. Moved by Gasterlin, do I have a second? Thank second you. by Contreras. Okay, <laughs> second by Contreras. Anthony, please call for the vote. Ma'am. On the motion of board member Terry Gaston, I second by board member Corinna Contreras to approve this, the minutes of the special and regular board meetings of January 20th, 2022, and consent items one through three and five through 10. Board member Costa, how do you vote? Yes. Board member Gaston? Yes. Board member Hinsey? Yes. Board member McNamara? Yes. Board member Rodriguez? Rodriguez, yes. Rodriguez, yes. Thank you, sir. Board member Desmond? Board member Jenkins? Yes. Board chair Edson? Yes. Board member Contreras? Aye. Motion passes with all board members present voting yes. Board member Desmond, absent. Okay, thank you. Um, item four has been called or has, has been pulled from the agenda. Um, uh, since this is on safety, I'm assuming that uh, we have Mr. Lithbro present. Excuse me, ma'am. Because item four was pulled, we will move that agenda item to the end of the agenda. Um, my intention is actually to hear it now. Um, uh, my understanding is that items from consent may be trailed to the end of the regular agenda or at the chair's discretion may be heard immediately following approval of the remaining consent items. Since those items have been approved, unless the board has an objection, I suggest that item four be heard immediately. Seeing no hands raised as objections, um, with that in mind, I would like to hear item four now if we could, or pull item four now if we could. And since there's probably not a presentation, maybe we could move to the comments from uh, the public, please. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. I have a Ms. Camilla Rang. Ms. Rang, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you pull up my presentation? Thank you. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Dear board members, I would like to talk about safety on Delmar Bluff and give some advice on how to upgrade it. As can be seen on the table here, half of the near misses in Delmar is by the legal crossing at Coast Boulevard and the other half is on the bluff. So let's break it down. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of the crossing at Coast Boulevard where cars and people are stopped by beams and sounds. It's a very high traffic beach area, both for car and pedestrians, so clearly not the best place for a train crossing the road. I would suggest to not increase the train traffic until the train has been relocated from this crossing and slow the trains down. Next slide, please. The other half of the near misses in Del Mar are always happening in and around this very dangerous blind curve between Coast Boulevard and 13th Street. On the upper right, you can see the very dangerous blind curve as the train turns into the bluff going south. On the lower right picture, you can see the rails going from north, uh, north from 13th. You cannot see beyond the upcoming curve. There's not a single warning sign anywhere here that says that this is a live railroad. We need a fence from Coast Boulevard to 13th Street and lots of warning signs from both directions. Let me tell you why. Next slide, please. At 11th Street is a decades old crossing that people have used ever since the railroad took down the overpass in 1970 at 10th Street. There's not a single sign that says that this is an active railroad. 
All locals and all surfers know it, but if you're a tourist and see that ugly, rusted, cracked up railroad area, you may very well think that this is a deserted railroad and then just cross without thinking twice. Once at the other side, they may start walking north towards Coast Boulevard and a dangerous curve because there's no sign on the other side either that wants you not to walk north. The only sign of this well-used crossing is a rusty old thing that says the cliff is unstable. Nothing about a railroad. Only if you turn to walk south, there's a sign about the railroad where most people turn north because that's where the goat trail is. And if you can't find it, you will keep on going. We need more signs here. Next slide, please. The other well-used pedestrian crossing is by 8th Street. Same thing here. Not a single sign in sight. If you're not from here, you may very well think it's a charming deserted railroad. Perfect for pictures. Next slide, please. But... Instead of fencing off where the accidents happen and putting up signs at the crossing, you are made fencing off the upper bluff for priority. I'm not sure how you're thinking there. There's never in history been an accident up there. It's impossible to have a train accident on a path that is 40 feet above and away from the rails, and no one has ever, ever fallen down from the upper bluff onto the rails. It is almost an impossible feat. Yet, you want Del Mar to sign off on a deal without even disclosing where on the upper bluff such a fence will be located, knowing that the path itself at many places is less than seven feet wide, which is the code to edge for a fence. So please concentrate your effort where it's needed. Fence off from Coast Boulevard to 13th Street. Put up signs or safe crossings at 11 and 8th. Do not increase train traffic and that the rail is off the bluff since not even the legal crossing at Coast Boulevard is safe. And please slow down the trains. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ring. Next speaker, please, Anthony. Yes, ma'am. We have a Mr. John Stahl. John Stahl, can you hear us? Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes. You have three minutes. I listened with great interest and some surprise when the North County Safety Officer, Mr. Sean Loofborough, called into the Coastal Commission meeting on February 10th. He stated that the only safe crossing at Del Mar is at Coast Boulevard. If the only safe crossing is also where the overwhelming majority of accidents are, then you haven't done enough there and you need to improve the safety environment at Coast Boulevard and down through 13th Street. Waiting until your phase two fencing plan to address that section must be some sort of inside baseball that the public is not privileged to understand. There must be something else going on here. In the safety division quarterly report, attachment 4A, page 10, it lists Coast Boulevard by itself and lumps the rest of the rail line through Del Mar as a single item. I would suggest a much better way to get a handle on the cause of the problems would be to regroup that data as Coast Boulevard down to 13th, and then secondly, from 13th Street to the southern end of Del Mar. Doing that would give you a much better picture of why the need for improved signage and fencing would be from Coast Boulevard to 13th Street. That reclassified southern stretch would be as safe as any mile in the 41 mile coaster corridor. The citizens of Del Mar and millions of visitors from your towns, yes, your very towns want safety. Your citizens and residents come to Del Mar to enjoy the bluff, the beach and the sunsets. If you were to do a Pareto analysis on the rail line running through Del Mar, it is crystal clear that Coast Boulevard down at 13th is where the problem is and where the priority should be. It has been portrayed numerous times in the Union Tribune and on CBS 8 that the city and citizens of Del Mar have been completely uncooperative in finding a solution to this situation. If you would focus on Coast Boulevard to 13th Street, you would find complete support from us in that endeavor. I've heard it said many times that North County puts safety first. Your phase one fencing plan makes absolutely no sense. You're going to fence off with hog wire, the safest stretch of the corridor, and wait until phase two and additional funding to fence off the most dangerous part of the track. Someone would have to explain that logic to me. In my opinion, you are operating on the principles of bureaucratic overreach and spend it or lose it rather than common sense and logic. Please have someone from North County explain to the people of Del Mar and San Diego why it is so important to fence off the safest part of the corridor and leave the most dangerous part for another funding cycle. Openly defying and bracingly dismissing the Coastal Commission and the Attorney General, as you have done, will not sit well with the voters on this next election cycle. Seconds. Fencing south of 13th Street is not about safety. It is purely about bureaucratic overreach and the bully tactic of because we said so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stahl. Anthony, next speaker, please. Those are all the public speakers, ma'am. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, do any board members have questions or comments? So Chair, I do, I've raised my hand. I was just looking and I saw your hand. Thank you, um, Board Member Gasterlin. Yes, Chair Edson, thank you. Um, I have a few questions and I, I, I believe they would be addressed to Sean. Um, preventable accident versus non-preventable accident. Could you tell us a little bit about what a non-preventable accident is and what a preventable accident is? And you're muted. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Oh, we're getting feedback. All right, how about now? Still quite a bit. Do you have two devices on in the same room? No, I just have the phone. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> How about now? Do you have your volume, uh, your speaker on, on your computer and on your phone? Sean, no, I don't. I just hung up the phone. Is this better? Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't know what the feedback was, so I apologize for that. Uh, so preventable accidents uh, are something that the operator did that uh, would cause the accident. So let's say um, you're driving a bus and uh, they were to sideswipe a vehicle. So in that case, that was operator induced and that would be a preventable. Uh, a non-preventable would be something that the operator couldn't control or, or uh, something that was out of their hands that couldn't be prevented. So uh, what that could be would be, uh, let's say a, a bus is at a, a stop and somebody were to come by and, and clip the mirror of the bus, uh, a POV, for example, that would be considered a non-preventable accident. Okay, so it's from the perspective of the driver. Okay, that makes sense. Um, otherwise, it's like, if it's non-preventable, is that an accident? <laughs> yeah. Um, rail critical incidents, what is that? Uh, so anything that causes a significant uh, disruption in service. Uh, so typically those uh, on the rail side are rail strikes, either of vehicles or trespassers. Okay, and then near misses, you define somewhat as an action taken by the operator of a train, um, which would include slowing or initiating an emergency braking. Um, what else would be included under the category of near misses? So anything, so if they uh, reduce the throttle, so they don't even actually have to hit the brakes. So if they change the operating configuration of the vehicle, so again, just slowing down uh, any brake application or emergency brake, all of those would be considered a near miss event because of the, whatever the activity is around the rail, it causes the operator to do something different other than the normal operation. What about blowing the horn? Is that considered a near miss or is that not? That's not considered a near miss. That's an action due to a hazard that's observed. There's specific places such as crossings where they have a certain cadence that they have to blow, uh, but at any point they have the right, if they feel that there's a hazard to sound the horn. So that is not considered a near miss activity. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is about the numbers um, of near misses, 45 on the San Diego line, which would be the railroad track from Oceanside down to San Diego. And there were nine incidents near misses at Washington Street. If you add them up, there are 12 in Encinitas, if you take Cardiff, Encinitas, and Locadia together. And in Del Mar, there were three on the Del Mar Bluffs and three at Coast Boulevard. Where were the three that were on the Del Mar Bluffs? Uh, I would have to look specifically at those at the videos to determine where they were at the mile post. So I don't have that information, but I can certainly provide that to you. That would be really useful information because that will help us to understand. Um, and then I guess last question is the source of data, you know, is there a place to be able to download a spreadsheet or a, a comma separated file with this, these data? Yeah, we retain all of our data in our safety database uh, and, and that's where it's all maintained. So we have the, we have it all stored, yes ma'am. And so for me to go get it would take what? Uh, I think through the uh, public records request is typically how that data is requested. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chair, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Seeing no further hands raised, may I have a motion to approve agenda item four? I'll move approval. This is Hinzi. 
Second, Acosta. Uh, motion by Hensi, second Acosta. Anthony, please call the vote. Yes, ma'am. On the motion of board member Hinsey, seconded by board member Acosta to approve agenda item number, item number four. Board member Acosta, how do you vote? Yes. Board member Gasoline? Yes. Board member Hinsey? Yes. Board member McNamara? Yes. Board member Rodriguez? Rodriguez, yes. Board member Desmond? Board member Jenkins? Yes. Board chair Edson? Yes. Board member Contreras? Aye. Motion passes with all board members present voting yes. Board member Desmond absent. Thank you. Uh, next, we have two action items under other business. Laura Cote, Chief Administrative Officer, will present item 11. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. This item is asking the board to consider the option of holding virtual meetings through March 17th per Assembly Bill 361, or to resume in-person meetings. Next slide, please. And as mentioned at prior board meetings, Governor Newsom signed AB 361 into law back in September, which modified the provisions of the government code related to teleconference public meetings. This bill is technically in effect until January 1st, 2024, and allows local agencies to hold meetings virtually so long as state or local officials have declared a state of emergency or those same officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. The state of emergency is now due to expire next month on March 30th. And at this time, although we are tracking this, we are not aware of an intention to extend the state of emergency. As an update overall regarding COVID, the state mask mandate was modified effective yesterday and lifted the requirement for vaccinated individuals to wear a face covering indoors. NCTD, however, did choose to extend this mandate at all work locations for an additional two weeks. And that is due to the number of employees that we have testing positive over the last 30 days. We'll continue to monitor that. And our hope and expectation is that after this two weeks of monitoring, we will be able to lift that mask mandate. We're also closely watching for an update from the governor that is expected to be announced, we believe today, which will address how the state will quote, coexist with the coronavirus. And we'll certainly um, take a look at any provisions in there and how that applies to this agency. So overall, if the board does wish to resume in-person meetings, we wanted to let you know that we are prepared technologically to allow for members of the public to continue participating um, virtually and certainly in person if we do go back to in-person meetings. And we would like to work with board leadership to develop more clear protocols as it relates to the board um, and any protocols that you wish to implement at this time essentially to transition back to in-person. So next slide is what we're asking the board to consider today. So before you is one of, or one of two alternatives that we'd like you to discuss. The first is adopting a resolution, which is required um, during a local emergency if you wish to continue with virtual meetings. So you'll be re-ratifying the proclamation of a state of emergency and reauthorizing remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the North County Transit District in compliance with Assembly Bill 361, effective February 18th, 2022 through March 17th, 2022, or to resume in-person meetings effective February 18th, uh, 2022. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Laura. Anthony, are there any public comments on this agenda item? There are not, sir. Ma'am, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, since, uh, so at this time, we're ending the public registration to speak on this item. I see that there are a couple of hands up on the board. Um, board member Contreras. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you know, I recently had the unfortunate experience of getting COVID and uh, last week was basically my first week back where I had enough energy to do just the regular course of business. So 
Um, I don't believe that the situation has dramatically changed uh, for the better. Um, you know, I don't know if uh, we would be in favor of a hybrid system where um, some folks who want to attend in person can attend um, and some of those who would rather participate um, virtually could attend, but uh, I would be in favor of uh, re-ratifying the proclamation of the state of emergency, um, especially with the information provided uh, in this presentation that a lot of our uh, employees, our coworkers at North County Transit District uh, continue to test positive. So it's not exactly a safe environment um, at this moment, but I wanna hear from the rest of uh, my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, board member Jenkins. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is similar to that, what was just stated. I see option one and two, but I don't see a possible hybrid option. So I would like to, you know, just question if we could do a hybrid of some kind, respecting the fact that some people do want to stay remote and others are okay going into the into a meeting room. So that would be my comment that I would also like to see a hybrid. And with that question, are you looking for a hybrid by next month, say for a March meeting or for something farther in the future? I would say March would be fine. Okay. Chair, would you like me to address how that would occur? Yes, please. Um, Anthony, would you mind forwarding slides? Uh, one of the things to think about if a proclamation um, has not been ratified today, then what we would do is revert to the, what I would call the traditional Brown Act considerations. And so if you could just advance one more, um, I wanted to, we do have a quick little cheat sheet here of what that would require to do the hybrid. And again, just for my clarification, what I understand that to mean is some board members would participate in person here at the NCTV location and others would, would participate virtually. So that's what I'm going off of to answer the question. And so essentially what that would mean is for those of you who would be participating virtually, um, it would need to be in a location where members of the public could attend. So agendas, um, would be required to be posted at the location. And if you could please advance to the next slide, I'll just run through that. Um, at least here on the left-hand side during teleconference meetings, at least a quorum of the members of the legislative body shall participate from locations within the boundaries of the territory. Next slide. And the agenda again is shall be providing an opportunity for members of the public to address the body at each teleconference location. Next slide. Oh, <laughs> so those were the, the main um, parts to just think through. Um, if we do have a hybrid uh, situation that we would need to revert back to the original Brown Act requirements related to that. Okay, thank you. Um, board member Jenkins, your hands still raise. Are oh, sorry. Okay, okay. no worries. Um, board member Gasterland. Yeah, I wanna make two observations. Uh, the first observation is as we make this transition and people are wearing their masks less and less, um, it's, we're going to enter a stage, a status where we don't know. Um, there's uncertainty. Um, cases may go up, we don't know. The next month is going to teach us a lot. Um, for that reason alone, I would advocate staying remote for the March meeting. The other observation is, although cases are declining, the hospitalization rate is still very high and the death rate is still high compared to what it's been. So we're, we're still on that upward trend on the hospitalizations and the death rates, although we're going down in cases. So hospitalization and death rate always lags behind the cases and you know, both go up and down. So again, for that reason, and because we don't know where, which way things are gonna go, whether there'll be bumps or bumpiness in the trends this next month, I, I would recommend that we stay remote for March and consider the hybrid again next month. Is that a motion? I move. 
Okay, uh, motion by Gasterlin, second by Edson. Please call the vote. Yes, ma'am. On the motion of board member Terry Gasland, seconded by board chair Joel Edson to adopt res resolution number 22, TAC 03, reauthorizing remote meetings. Board member Acosta, how do you vote? Yes. Board member Gasland? Yes. Board member Hinsey? Yes. Board member McNamara? Yes. Board member Rodriguez? No. Board member Desmond? Board member Jenkins? No. Board Chair Edson? Yes. Board Member Contreras? Aye. Motion passes with all board members present voting yes. Board Member Jenkins, Board Member Rodriguez vote no. Board Member Desmond, absent. Thank you. Chris Orlando, Chief of Planning, Marketing, and Communications will now review item 12. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Edson. Um, item 12 is an update regarding uh, the discussions to address the shortfall in the 8.1% of transnet designated for uh, transit operations. Um, a meeting was held in January with the leadership of NCTD, SANDAG, and MTS to uh, develop a uh, compromise regarding the allocation of this funding. Um, I'm going to provide a, a summary of the topic, uh, as well as a summary of the compromise framework that was agreed to, uh, and then ask the board to um, authorize the executive director to uh, execute an agreement with SANDAG, uh, memorializing the uh, compromise allocation. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. Um, oh, that's actually the one I just did, Anthony, one more. I uh, wanted to provide the board with uh, a bit of a timeline uh, regarding uh, this issue. The board's received updates in its January and December uh, meetings uh, about this topic, but I thought it'd be helpful just to give you a little bit of the history around uh, how we ended up here. So uh, as the board knows, the trans uh, net extension um, authorized and, and funded enhanced coaster operations. Um, in 2019, Sandag approved um, $58.8 million to add new capacity by acquiring, uh, to acquire new train sets. Uh, in 2020, um, uh, NCTD and Sandag took steps to uh, develop and agree upon the operating plan for the new enhanced service. Uh, in 2021, in June and July, uh, this board held public hearings and then approved the enhanced service uh, expansion. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, in September, um, the new schedule was announced and a, um, an agreement uh, for the mobilization costs was, was executed between um, Sandag and NCTD. And then as the board knows, in October of 2021, um, NCTD launched the expanded service, increasing the weekday and week weekend uh, frequencies for the coaster. Um, that same day, uh, we were notified by Sandag that um, they didn't intended not to execute the MOU for those operating costs for the new service. Um, uh, discussions occurred at that time, uh, and within a few days, a compromise was, was reached to fund the operations through June of 2022. Um, in, at your December meeting, the board received an update uh, both regarding this topic uh, as well as um, the overall changes to the Transnet ordinance that the Sandag Executive Director has proposed. In January, in its last board meeting, uh, the NCTD board um, authorized the Executive Director to draft and send a letter to Sandag uh, regarding the topic uh, and to um, reinforce the principle of regional equity in the, dis in the discussions. And then uh, at the end of January, uh, the leadership of all three organizations, NCTD, MTS, and SANDAG met to develop the compromise framework for the allocation of the Transnet 8.1 funding that I'll review uh, this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. So uh, here is the framework for the compromised allocation. So, um, the eligibility for the 8.1 Transnet funding um, would be limited to services that were in operation as of December 31st, 2021. 
uh, the funding would exclude all capital expenditures. Um, it's an eight year agreement um, uh, through which SANDAG would continue the funding uh, through December 30th, uh, December 31st, uh, 2030. Uh, in the fifth year of the agreement, SANDAG will begin annual evaluations of ridership level uh, and overall productivity will ensure the services continue to be effective. Um, and then SANDAG, MTS, and NCTD will continue to seek new funding sources to, um, to augment the operation costs for those for the services. Next slide, please, Anthony. So uh, there are several significant impacts for NCTD with this proposed agreement. Um, uh, first, the, uh, the agreement provides funding for coastal operations that um, occurred, the in increase in co coastal operations that occurred in October, 20, uh, October 2021. So this past October, the increase to 30 trains on the weekdays and the increase to 20 trains on the weekends. So this funding, this funding would support that uh, service enhancement. Um, and it, it, it does establish funding certainty for those operations through 2030. Um, so that's that's an improvement over over the um, sh short term agreement that we are currently under. Um, it allocates uh, approximately twenty percent of the Transnet eight point one revenues to NCTD operations. Um, uh, so that's a significant uh, uh, development. Um, what it does not do is provide significant funding or sufficient funding uh, to increase coaster frequencies to forty two um, weekday trains and increase sprinter frequency to uh, fifteen minute headways versus the 30 minute headways as previously planned. Um, so to address that last point, staff is uh, evaluating a phased implementation plan for the coaster frequency improvements um, and potentially increasing the average week take to 36 trains in 2023 and 42 trains uh, in 2024 uh, based on ridership performance and uh, funding availability. So rather than going to the 42 trains uh, uh, right from the 30 to the 42 trains, um, we're exploring a phased approach that would consider uh, additional available funding and, and ridership performance. Um, and in addition, SANDAG has expressed a commitment to help identify new funding um, to support those expanded services. Next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, a couple of key considerations as the board discusses this, this proposed um, agreement. Um, first, it's important to note that the Transnet 8.1 revenues um, were intended to provide uh, uh, operation or funding for new services through 4048. However, there was no commitment within that funding um, that they would fully fund those enhanced services. So, so never committed to fund the full services. Um, both transit agencies continue to recover ridership uh, and customer revenue that was lost due to COVID, um, which affects previously planned service expansions. Um, in regard to the Sprinter, the um, corridor requires capital funding to implement the 15 minute headway. So there's capital improvements we need to make to get to 15 minute frequencies. And we haven't yet identified um, funding for those capital investments. So, so that funding is not there to have the infrastructure for the 15 minute uh, coaster headways. Um, and as the board knows, there is a coalition of stakeholders that's exploring a ballot initiative um, that would provide a permanent half cent sales tax that could, uh, could augment the current uh, 8.1 funding to help support future services. Um, next slide, please, Anthony. So um, with, with that overview, the staff is recommending that the board authorize the executive director to um, execute a funding agreement uh, with SANDAG for the allocation of the Transnet 8.1% funding. And with that, I will take any board questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Anthony, do we have any public comments for this agenda item? No, ma'am. Okay, um, at this time we're ending the public registration to speak on this item. So before we move to the board's question, um, as the board considers this item, there are a couple of important points that I would like to make before we move to questions and comments. Over the past few months, I participated in the discussions with SANDAG and MTS and circulated a memo to you about the proposed agreement. First, I was very pleased that both SANDAG Chair Blakespear and Vice Chair Gloria expressed strong, strong support for the principle of regional equity that our board voiced in the letter that we approved and sent to SANDAG about this issue. It's a positive step forward for all North County to have that principle reinforced. 
Second, while the proposed agreement may not provide everything we asked for, it is important for NCTD and the region that we develop a collaborative solution to address the shortfall and establish budget certainty for the 8.1% funding. With that said, it's time for Chris to take questions for the board. Board member Acosta. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for, for those comments, Chair. Um, I know that a lot of work has been put into this and there's been a lot of communication about uh, regional equity and some of the other really important points in this proposal. One of the things that uh, caught my eye and I was talking about with my Carlsbad City Transportation staff was the five years until there's an evaluation uh, of the, the bus routes. And I just wanted to, to ask why we're waiting five years. Usually we do annual evaluations right away so we can make changes and adjustments as needed. And I'm wondering why there would be five years going by before the first evaluation and then annual evaluations thereafter. Could you please uh, answer that question, staff? Thank you. Sure, sure. So um, uh, the discussion around, that was one of the negotiation points and discussion centered around um, the uh, one uh, fact that these services um, are being launched in the middle of, of, the, of the pandemic. And so the challenges of, of having a stabilized operation uh, during that time frame. So both our uh, coaster service expansion, but also the, um, the uh, mid-coast extension of the trolley. So both uh, launched just this last fall. Um, the second is, is just the time it takes for new service such as these to be normalized. Um, and, and see, you know, stabilized ridership. So, so that's typically two plus years for a new service to, to be normalized. And so the, the um, uh, logic behind that, that time frame was both to give time for uh, ridership to recover through the pandemic and for these new services to normalize their operations. Okay, thank you. And I'm wondering if there's any, um any wiggle room uh, for that because two years of normalization makes a lot of sense, but five years is a really long time. So I'm wondering if those conversations were already had during the negotiations uh, and you know how, how final this actually is. Yeah, so those conversations were had during the no uh, negotiations and this is, this is the framework that, that the region agreed to, both, um, both SANDAG and MTS and um, uh, uh, you know, the NCTD through the negotiations, obviously the, the board, you know, will, will um, vote on whether or not to accept the terms, but those were, those are the negotiated terms. Okay. Thank you for the answers to my questions. That's it. Hey, are there any other questions from the board? Seeing no hands raised. Board member Jenkins. Yes. I'll ask a question. Um, I understand the benefit of collaborating and um, uh, and all of that, but but given the fact that we've been receiving, I don't know if it's twenty seven or thirty percent all along, um, what is the what is the answer as to uh, I guess to go from thirty percent to twenty percent and then have to um, not have sufficient funding for the coaster frequencies. Um, what's the rationale for beyond just being collaborative and to doing to wanting to agree to this? Yeah, so um, understandable, um, and and I think it's important for the the, the board to understand that this was a um, was a uh, negotiated settlement, and so you know, so a lot of work, and, and as Chair Edson knows, a lot of discussions back and forth. Um, regarding regarding the the allocation, um, and the the twenty percent yeah, wasn't necessarily a, a, a um, we didn't negotiate to a number um, we negotiated to the services so so as the um, framework outlined it was the services that were um, in place on uh, at the end of last year and, and the logic there was let, let's not add new service that isn't already in place so, so that we are in a position to have to have to make um, reductions in the future. So um, what the net of that was is, is a 20% allocation to, to NCTV. So we didn't, we didn't negotiate the percentage per se. Um, it was more the uh, substance of uh, keeping uh, service that was in place at the end of the last year in place going you know, through 2030. So that, that was 
that was how, how we arrived at the number. Um, the other point to, uh, to make on, on that is um, uh, when we entered these negotiations, there was a, um, a considerable push for having our percentage be significantly less, uh, less than 20%, um, which, which was the um, motivation for us pursuing the letter and the updates we gave to the board through the end of last year and the first part of this year. And so there, there was a significant push to uh, either uh, not fund our enhanced operations um, that we had already launched or to base that funding purely on, on ridership, which would have been a 90-10 split. Uh, and, so, um, and so while this isn't you know, the 27 or 30% that, that we had endeavored to get, um, it is, you know, a good uh, percentage and it gives us some budget certainty through 2030 and allows the region as a whole to put this issue behind it and focus on other things. And, and Chair, if I can uh, just add a couple of uh, points. Um, just for clarity, and I think Board Member Jenkins is well aware of this. So the 7030s remains in effect as it relates to local and federal funding. The money that we're talking about today was money that NCTD had never received before October. Uh, this money was money that was lockbox within SANDAG based upon new serve, uh, the Transnet ordinance based on new services being operated. Um, the first new service that we had operated um, was the service that began in October of last year. Um, as we documented in the prior communication, MTS had already had a significant amount of services to include the bus rapid transit routes to Superloop, um, in addition, um, as well as the Midcoast, which came online prior to NCTD. So essentially part of this discussion is about a timing of when we got to the table. Um, and then as Chris um, well articulated, um, the kind of the, the fact that given where we are, the decision was made to not add any additional services. So no one negotiated to a percentage. It was negotiated to an outcome based upon what we, where we sit today with the goal of being able to augment those funding either through uh, one-time funding or through uh, creative use of funding or through potential new revenue sources that may come about um, over the course of the next years. Um, I do wanna just add another point uh, just for uh, board member Acosta. So, in terms of the negotiations and, and the language related to the, uh, the, the review, that is just relate, related to the transnet ordinance portion of it. Within NCTD each year, we do an annual review of services and we present it to the board. Um, as we head into the budget process, welcome new board members. You're going to see a copy of a document called the service implementation plan, which documents our analysis and, uh, and review of services from the past fiscal year. So that happens on an annual basis from NCTD every year. So that is going to occur no matter what. Thanks, Matt. Did that answer your question, uh, Board Member Jenkins? Uh, uh, yes, I, that brought up one more question. Um, there was mention about, um, you know, the future funding, potential ballot initiative. It talks about that the initiative would include operating funds for MTS and NCTD. Who's going to dictate those percentages on um, which agency is going to get what percentage? Matt, do you want to go or would you like to? <laughs> yeah, I, I will go. That ultimately okay. will be, uh, so I, I mean, Sharon, I think, as you know, Staff can't really be involved in that. Right. But I have read that document. Um, you know, my, my assumption would be that the SANDAC would continue to distribute that those funding 7030. I will say the reading of that um, uh, that potential transportation initiative uh, appears to give the SANDAC board a lot more flexibility, but it does call out specifically said uh, MTS and NCTD as agencies receiving operating funds. So it is unknown specifically what decision would be made about how those funds are allocated. And if I can just weigh in here, I think that, that with that in mind, it's really important that those letters that were sent um, to each jurisdiction um, with the request that they send them to SANDAG, 
talking about this equity uh, situation, equitable distribution of funds situation is really important. So please keep that in mind if your city hasn't already forwarded that letter to um, SANDAG, to the SANDAG chair and, and to the others that were copied. Um, it's really important that we continue to make it be known that we <laughs> expect our share. So uh, board member Gasterlin, your hand is raised. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm clear. So we're talking, so did I hear that these transnet funds are being unlocked for the first time because for the first time NCTD is expanding services? Yeah, you know, I, I wanna understand that. That's what I heard, but I'd like to get just that, Yeah, just a that clarification. Is oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Oh, no, go ahead, Chris. I was just gonna say, uh, so this fund has been, has been active um, since Transnet, nor Transnet ordinance went into, went into effect. Um, MTS has been drawing on the fund for expanded services since about 2010. Um, we, NCT did not, NCTD did not have the infrastructure in place to, to um, do the expanded services until, uh, until the train, set, train sets that I referenced at the beginning of the presentation were acquired and put into service. And then the service was launched in October. So, so the reason we, we were just activating it uh, in this past October was because we needed the infrastructure uh, in place to, to do the service. Okay. And so the new services are the extra coaster runs. Mm -hmm. Are there new bus services that NCTD has now? So the um, Transnet 8.1 funding was um, uh, specifically for um, transit service within the major corridors and specifically referenced coaster enhancements. And so this, this particular um, funding stream, the 8.1% within Transnet, was specifically called out for um, two, two NCTD major projects, the coaster enhancements and then the sprinter headway enhancements. So, so um, bus uh, for NCTD was not, not called out um, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that particular uh, budget or uh, in the uh, Transnet ordinance. Okay, so it's for the coaster. Um, yeah, coaster and sprinter. Coaster and the sprinter. So the sprinter is also expanded? Uh, no, as referenced earlier in the presentation, um, that would be the 15 minute headways for Sprinter, which the infrastructure is not in place yet to, to have that service uh, increased. Okay, so with this sharing um, proportion set up, is this queuing us up for a shortfall on the cost of the, coast, the increased coaster services? You know, is it that this is now going to be a loss? No. no. So the, the, the effect of this was to address the shortfall. So, so um, when the additional services that were planned under this funding stream um, that are not in place yet uh, uh, created the shortfall that we've talked about earlier. So through this agreement and the agreement not to um, uh, implement those expanded services, those additional expanded services, unless more funding is allocated or found, um, this addresses the shortfall through 2030. Uh, uh, you know, so there, so it wouldn't run a deficit uh, until that in, until 2033. Okay, so so I'll make a comment, and that's it. Will be very important for this board to watch those lines in the graphs on page 17 and 18 of the finances report. You know, those, those black lines are going to continue into this year. Let's see where the trends are. You know, the sprinters up, the breeze, the buses flat, and the coasters trending downward already in 2022 compared to the sprinter trending, trending upward. Okay, that answers my questions, thank you. Thank you, board member Gasterlin. Seeing no more hands. Um, uh, gosh, let's see. Do I have a, a motion to approve agenda item 12? So moved, this is Hinzi. Do I have a second? Second, Acosta. Motion Morning. by Hensi, second by Acosta. Please call the vote. What, Jewel? Yes, sorry. Uh, it, it says that it's just a um, okay. receive an update. Ah, oh, gosh, sorry. Uh, I lost my my way on the agenda. No, I'm um, sorry, Chair Edson. Uh, we were asking for um, authorize the executive director to execute the funding agreement. So, so it is an action by the board. Okay, okay. thank you. Yes, this is item 12. 
So um, does that motion stand, uh, motion maker? It sure does. Okay, and second? Okay, on the motion of board member. On the board, on the motion of board member Hensey, seconded by board member Ocosta to approve agenda item 12. Board member Ocosta, how do you vote? Yes. Board member Gasoline? Um, I'm going to vote no on this. And it's because of this five years for, before the reevaluation. I really do think we should be reevaluating earlier than that. Board member Hensey? Yes. Board member McNamara? Yes. Board member Rodriguez? No. Board member Desmond? Board member Jenkins? Yes. Board chair Edson? Yes. Board member Contreras? Aye. Motion passes. Board members Rodriguez and Gasolin? No. Board member Desmond? Absent. Thank you, Anthony. Now we're getting to the informational items. Um, we have two informational items on the agenda. Tracy Foster, Chief Development Officer, will review item 13. Thank you, Chair Edson, and good afternoon, board members. I'm excited to talk to you today about our redevelopment activities. We have a lot going on, and this presentation intends to bring you all up to speed on the opportunities. So first, let's just quickly talk about why redevelopment. In 2016, the Board of Directors adopted Board Policy Number 33 to create goals, objectives, and procedures for redevelopment, or I'm sorry, for real property development. Uh, the policy establishes the Board's intention to achieve the maximum utilization and benefits of district-owned property. And the objectives and goals include transit prioritization, so first and foremost, we are a transit district, and so any redevelopment needs to preserve NCTD property for transit use and increase transit ridership by retaining uh, existing and attracting new riders. Fiscal responsibility, uh, redevelopment projects are expected to generate value by maximizing ground rent, revenues received, while minimizing financial risk to NCTD. And community integration and engagement. As we progress with redevelopment opportunities, NCTD will seek to create projects that are compatible with the surrounding community and will engage the local community members throughout the land use and entitlement process. Next slide, please. Uh, redevelopment also has benefits to the economy, the local government, and society. Through redevelopment, jobs are created and local spending increases. NCTD realizes a long-term term revenue stream through ground leases and increased ridership, while local jurisdictions will see increases in the tax base. Lastly, redevelopment of NCTD's assets can further support the region's housing needs through affordable and market rate housing. And with housing locations directly adjacent to transportation, reduce the reliance on vehicles. Next slide. Uh, first up, we have Oceanside Transit Center. So since 2019, we have been steadily progressing the redevelopment of this site. Uh, since issuing the RFP in 2020, we have finalized agreements with Toll Brothers and completed the due diligence period. Toll Brothers has now commenced the entitlement process with the city of Oceanside, and we anticipate that this process um, will take approximately two years. Next slide. Just as a refresher, uh, the OTC or Oceanside Transit Center redevelopment will deliver a new 50,000 square foot administrative office building and parking that will accommodate the building's need, a ticketing center for all transit modes. The bus island will be relocated from the northern part of the site to align next to the rail platforms, allowing for easier connections amongst the modes. Uh, replacement of transit rider surface parking that exists today um, and improve the amenities and public spaces to enhance the transit riders experience. Um, we will realize long-term ground lease revenue 
and market rate and affordable housing units will be a part of this redevelopment. Next slide. We've also been moving things along for the redevelopment of both the Carlsbad Village and Poinsettia Station sites. CBRE is supporting NCTD with this work and last year delivered a highest and best use analysis. And just last week we had our developers workshop and we had 57 people attend virtually. Also this week, um, as part of the housing element update, the City of Carlsbad City Council reviewed both NCTD sites that were included as potential housing sites to study for rezoning. The City Council was supportive of continuing to study the Carlsbad Village and Poinsettia Station sites and also moved to increase the density for both sites. Next slide. So um, we presented this video as a marketing tool um, at our developers workshop and wanted to share um, what we presented with you as well. Go ahead. Welcome to a development opportunity that's as unique and attractive as Southern California itself, the Carlsbad Village and Poinsettia Transit Center's redevelopment project. This two property project will offer developers multiple opportunities to create mixed use developments that will serve a wide cross section of Californians all centered on a robust transit network. Located in the beautiful and highly sought after city of Carlsbad, these two properties are in the heart of Southern California. And with an easy commute to Los Angeles, San Diego, Oceanside, Vista, Escondido, and everywhere in between, Carlsbad is without a doubt one of the hottest SoCal markets. This unique development opportunity is centrally located between San Diego and Los Angeles in a strong employment base and nestled among four thriving economic hubs. Situated just two blocks from the Pacific Ocean in the historic and cultural hub of the city, Carlsbad Village Transit Center is strategically located near Carlsbad Boulevard and Interstate 5. This site offers 14.37 developable acres in Carlsbad Village, a one-of-a-kind atmosphere that offers unparalleled opportunities for residents and businesses of all sizes. Less than five miles south, we arrive at the second property of this exciting opportunity, Poinsettia Transit Center. This 11.47 developable acres also sits just two blocks from the ocean and in close proximity to Interstate 5, Poinsettia Lane, and Carlsbad Boulevard. Surrounding amenities for both sites include shopping and dining, parks and recreation, Legoland, hotels and resorts, and so much more. These transit centers are also strategically located near the Business Park West and Business Park East economic districts with fast access to Interstate 5 and the Palomar Airport. The Carlsbad Village and Poinsettia Transit Centers are crucial components of the mobility hub located between San Diego and Los Angeles. This transit system moves nearly 11 million bus and rail passengers annually throughout Southern California. By leveraging the capacities and routes of multiple transit providers like NCTD, MTS, Amtrak, and Greyhound, these sites connect Carlsbad to Southern California and the rest of the United States. There's no denying that Carlsbad exemplifies SoCal living. With its fantastic year-round weather, diverse economic drivers, and extremely strong demographics, Carlsbad is a spectacular, one-of-a-kind place to be. A two-site development opportunity that's strategically located, complete with ample surface parking, and easily accessible from multiple routes. The Carlsbad Village and Poinsettia Transit Center's project is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with seemingly limitless possibilities. Primed for redevelopment in a location at the heart of the region's economic expansion, the time to invest and redevelop is now. For more information, contact CBRE. So um, just a little bit more about Carlsbad Village. Um, as I mentioned, we completed the highest and best use analysis, which in, um, indicated that we could realize between 300 to 400 residential units on the Carlsbad Village site uh, while maintaining the existing parking for our transit riders. Redevelopment um, of this site has the potential to generate between two and a half uh, to $4 million annually for NCTD. Next slide. The Poinsettia station site is a little bit smaller. 
um, but could still yield 140 residential units and would also maintain the existing parking and could generate between 270,000 to 714,000 uh, annual revenue. Next slide. Our next steps for these sites um, is to issue an RFP. We intend um, to package the sites together. However, offering developers the option to bid on them individually or together. We will continue our collaboration with the city of Carlsbad and anticipate their participation in our source selection committee to evaluate the proposals that would be due in July. And then this fall, you'll see me again to share the proposal information and provide a recommendation to you on a developer or developers that we then enter into an uh, exclusive negotiation agreement with. Next slide. And during the th initial throes of COVID in 2020, CBRE was busy analyzing our sprinter stations. The work um, they were tasked to do included identification and prioritization of potential development opportunities. CBRE completed their work at the end of 2020 and a report was received by the board at the February 2021 board meeting. Additionally, NCTD staff met with city staff at Oceanside, Vista, and San Marcos to review the assessment and to begin collaboration efforts on the development possibilities. Next slide. As part of the assessment, um, all Sprinter locations were studied with the exception of College Boulevard, San Marcos Civic Center, and Cal State San Marcos Station, as these sites do not include any NCTD-owned land for parking. Uh, the remaining locations were assessed and prioritized based upon four criteria. The revenue potential, uh, reviewing both fee simple land values as well as ground lease potential. Um, second criteria is the development constraints and marketability. So can the site topography, the shape and the size accommodate a development? Um, what's the ease of marketability and the economic fundamentals? Third criteria was the land use and affordable housing opportunities. So this criteria looked at the highest and best use um, consistent with current zoning, as well as if the current zoning provides an opportunity to contribute to affordable housing goals. And lastly, uh, the criteria um, evaluated was uh, the potential to increase transit ridership. So looking at if the site supports multifamily developments, which have a higher density allowance than single family detached use, and basically more units correlating to potential for increased transit ridership. Next slide. Um, so in Oceanside, the Oceanside stations are the first on our list for redevelopment, offering the highest value to NCTD. It's anticipated that the four locations would be offered in one RFP and could collectively generate 86 housing units with an estimated ground lease revenue of over $1 million annually. The work to advance an RFP is anticipated to commence at the start of the fiscal year 2023. Uh, next slide. So um, in San Marcos, there's just one site uh, Palomar College Station, the existing two acre parcel um, is only partially developed for parking today with the other part of the parcel undeveloped. Uh, this site could generate 62 housing units and yield the long term revenue stream of almost 300,000 per year. There are also some adjacent land parcels that we may want to explore to perhaps create a larger, more cohesive development. And the redevelopment activities uh, will be furthered in the latter part of um, fiscal year 23. Next slide. Lastly, on our Sprinter parking lot redevelopment list, we have Vista Transit Center and Civic Center. Um, the site configuration for Vista Transit Center lends itself to commercial and hotel development, while the Vista Civic Center could generate 80 housing units. Annual long-term revenue for the combined sites is estimated at a little over 300,000 and redevelopment activities are anticipated to commence in fiscal years 23 and 24. 
So as we move forward with the Sprinter Station redevelopments with efforts commencing the latter part of this year, our strategies include packaging the sites by municipality, allowing for cohesive representation of the city's needs, um, advancing the sites that do not have as many planning or zoning considerations, and continuing our collaboration with our city partners. Next slide. On to Escondido Transit Center. We're um, excited about this significant redevelopment opportunity of almost 13 acres. The site today supports Breeze, Sprinter, MTS, and Greyhound services, and is envisioned as mixed-use development that could support city objectives. Next slide. CBRE is also supporting the work of this site, and just this week we received the first draft of the highest and best use analysis. So we have also started our collaboration efforts with the city and intend on sharing the findings of the report with them in the next couple of weeks. Um, so much more to come on this site, and I look forward to sharing the additional information with you as we progress the efforts on this site. Next slide. A couple of other activities I'd like to mention. Um, we are continuing our discussions with the city of Solana Beach with respect to the city having a property interest in the site in order to advance a development. While this has been a bit of a long process, the interest does remain strong and the ongoing communication is very positive. Um, we also have a few other Escondido properties that we are taking a closer look at. So in January, we entered into an MOU with the city of Escondido to further study NCTD and city properties for potential land exchange opportunities. Um, our East Division bus operations site, as well as our Sprinter operations facility are adjacent to a number of city properties. And this stu study will help us to understand the possibilities that can achieve objectives of both NCTD and the city. Uh, we've begun our scope of work development with the city for this study and intend to initiate this work within the next six months. Um, we will know more as to any implications to the Escondido Transit Center redevelopment as we continue our collaboration with the city and in advancing this study. And that concludes my presentation today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I was muted. I was talking away. Thank you, Tracy. Um, that was a very informative presentation. Lots of information there. Um, Anthony, do we have any public comments for item 13? No, ma'am. Okay, at this time, we're ending the public registration to speak on this item. I saw some board member hands raised. Um, Council member Rodriguez. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. So can you clarify when the RFP will be released on this? For the sprinter stations, I'm assuming Correct. that's, yeah. Um, so we um, will initiate an, um, a task order with CBRE to work on the RFP toward, once we get into the next fiscal year. So I would imagine that by the end of this year, we would be um, in a position to have an RFP released. And is your intent to do a, just a umbrella RFP outlining all the sites or like what, I'm trying to understand the delay because um, we're in some unique timing, especially with the Oceanside properties. What is the delay in waiting till next year and kind of going through all these studies um, of what we think the private sector wants to build versus creating flexibility and openness and letting the private developer go, here's what I think will work. Here's what I think will be profitable. What do you think board? Uh, and then we talk about that in closed session. Yeah, so, so we do have to um, put together the RFP. Again, I anticipate that an RFP would be released this year still. Um, and we would package for Oceanside the four sites together so that a developer could bid on one or more similar to how we intend to um, release the RFP for Carlsbad. Okay, 
so you want to package them all together to exclusively go with one developer that can develop all the sites? Is that what you just said? Uh, a develop we want to package all of the Oceanside sites together and it would be open for a developer to bid on one or all four. Okay, so if you have four different developers with four different ideas, you're going to consider all four different uh, entities. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Okay, perfect. And then uh, you listed the Oceanside Boulevard property as not part of the assessment. Can you clarify the reasoning behind that? I know you said you don't own it. Um, from my understanding, I thought you did. Who, who owns that? So there's the adjacent um, um, property owner of the, the um, retail there. And um, we have some parking there, but it's on their property and it's through an easement um, agreement for use of that parking. So we don't okay, have the it. rights to develop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. My, my only feedback with this is, um, you know, what I learned, we, we've done a whole revamp of our planning and, and development and we, we have streamlined development. Now we're a project that would usually take two years. We're getting approved in seven months because we're, we're cutting out the bureaucracy of it because the private sector knows what they want. We need to create an environment as a North County transit district board. We need to make revenue. And so it's in our best interest and our taxpayers' best interest to um, create as much flexibility as possible so that, you know, it, it's, it presents as much revenue as possible because, you know, when you look at our bottom lines, it's not looking so pretty. Um, and so I would just encourage flexibility um, on the RFPs, allow the private sector, allow the private developer Who's, who's the one that wants to make a profit, the one that wants to build, allow them flexibility uh, with state law matched with Oceanside. And I'm speaking on behalf, you know, from the perspective of Oceanside right now, we're doing our, our we're updating our general plan. It hasn't been updated in 39 years. We are, we are looking at everything possible. We're making exceptions. We're giving variances to the private uh, uh, developer, especially when they're adding in affordable housing. And then you have the whole, um, um, you know, state density bonus dynamic. And so I would just encourage you to get it out as fast as you can, because we're in a unique stage, especially for Oceanside, um, where, you know, the, the proposals they get to you, our staff can go, hey, we're in the middle of updating our general plan, our housing element, maybe we can do X, Y, Z um, and work together to make this easier for everybody. And so that would just be my, my feedback. I'm excited that um, we're going to use up these uh, ground parking lots and, you know, the, de the private developer could come in and, and build and, uh, you know, the individuals that, that lease these apartments are going to be able to take the transit uh, down and, you know, get to their job, get to their school. And um, it kind of, it, it does the uh, infill development, um, you know, build near transportation is kind of playing itself out um and that type of ecosystem so that's my feedback um is from the perspective of oceanside i think there's a lot of opportunity for north county transit district to uh get literally the best best deals uh over the next 36 months we we certainly agree on the opportunities and um we'll be pushing these out as quickly as possible um it is our goal to get we we know that it's a unique environment right now and we want to seize the moment um and and get things out there as quickly as possible um so thank you thank you thank you board member rodriguez do you have any further questions <clears throat> Okay. No, no, I don't. I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair. I'm good. I'm done. No worries. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Board Member Contreras. Uh, thank you, uh, Tracy, so much for the presentation. Uh, it's exciting to see that we are trying to utilize some of the uh, land that we own for uh, better use. Um, I do have a concern, and I, I come from a, a different um, uh, you know, philosophical thought than board member Rodriguez. I, I don't believe, you know, this is really valuable land. Um, I don't believe that, you know, we need to leave it up to the private sector to do whatever they want because 
in my neck of the woods, that means we get no setbacks. It means that, you know, um, the population that utilizes transit corridors um, kind of get cheated out of uh, urban amenities that they should get. Um, so I just want to state that, you know, uh, in a city um, that it seems like I think we've led the county in our rent going up um, 23%. Uh, there's a huge need for affordable housing and the only uh, part of this presentation that addressed affordable housing was a statement that was made uh, that I'm not 100%, I don't understand. Um, maybe you could clarify it. It, it was um, something to the effect of, you know, uh, affordable housing if the land um, use uh, provides that. Um, however, you know, uh, our ridership on the Sprinter and on the Breeze bus, uh, you know, I mean, if we want to match up riders and increase ridership, um, if we look at the population, we've done tons of surveys on our ridership and, and it's those who actually need affordable housing. Even if we're talking about, you know, 120% AMI um, to as low as, you know, 30% or whatever the case might be, um, but there's a huge need for affordable housing, and I don't want to uh, just give this land up um, with a myopic vision of trying to generate the most revenue possible um, without considering really long-term impacts on communities uh, and gentrification that is occurring in my city. So, you know, I know a lot of these land uses, they're by right, um, but I think that we should uh, really uh, push for more affordable housing. Um, it's, it's crucial, it's a crucial component, you know, to address uh, homelessness as well, right? So we, we need to have a, a holistic way of, of looking at the land um, that we currently have, because of course we want to maximize the revenue, uh, but we're not in a situation at North County Transit District where you know, we're, we have a shortfall right now. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty healthy. So I want to make sure we take a long-term perspective on what is best built uh, to grow our ridership um, and that will continue to provide revenues. So, you know, that's my feedback. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm definitely... Uh, not opposed to market rate or luxury housing, um, but it doesn't make sense to uh, avoid putting uh, some affordable housing where it's going to be utilized uh, by a lot of our, our writers or future um, writerships. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Board Member Contreras. Um, I I see that you're up next, um, Board Member Jenkins, but I also see that um, Mr. Tucker's hand is raised. I think he may want to <clears throat> respond to some of Council Member Contreras' comments. If that's the case, please jump ahead. Yes, ma'am. I, I learned to raise my hand. Thank you. Um, I appreciate so, that. <laughs> I think I'm going to say something that should make every board member happy. So um, in order for these developments to go forward, um, the, the fact of the matter is that the cities have to approve them. Um, and, and so in this specific discussion, uh, as board member Contreras brings up and as uh, board member Rodriguez, we work closely with the cities with the recognition that the developers have to be talking to the cities because there's a first line of approval that NCTD does, but the projects can't get built unless the cities approve those projects. The example uh, in the city of Oceanside for the Oceanside Transit Center project played out really well in terms of the outcomes based upon what the city was expecting. We got a really good development project that included a significant percentage of affordable housing. Um, and, and so I, I think the checks and balances are that the local communities will be driving those outcomes to ensure those types of projects. Um, are the ones that come forward for ultimately approval within those respective cities. That's why we invite in the early stages and all the way through the selection phases from an NCTD city participation so that we make sure that the project 
kids into a direction for success. That's kind of the large piece answer. The second thing is I agree wholeheartedly with Councilmember Rodriguez about us needing to advance this and move this forward. This has been something that the district has been trying to handle as another duty as assigned. One of my tasks this year over the course of the next couple of months is to make sure that we are resourced. This is a very unique time so that we can drive this program um, and get as many of these projects under contract as possible. So if, if all possible, if we can identify the additional resource, that's one position that we need, I would be looking to try to get as many of these out on the street from an RFP point of view as possible for, before the end of this year. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair. If I could <laughs> just build Mr. just a, a little bit on what Matt said, I, sure. the, in, in respect to the affordable housing, um, uh, and Matt mentioned this on the, the front end, but we, we go so far as um, even in the Oceanside uh, RFP that we establish evaluation criteria of the developers. And so we're looking at the developers and put certain weight on um, the evaluation as to what they can contribute from an affordable housing perspective. So we have that flexibility in working with the city and structuring the RFP and the evaluation criteria of the developers on the front end. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, okay, uh, board member Jenkins. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think my my comments have just been um, uh, taken away by the others. Um, my big thing is also I just want to make sure each of these areas have true affordable housing and that they're not all market rate housing. Mm -hmm. That's all. Board member Acosta. You may be muted. Trying. Okay, there, got it. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I also feel like uh, I could have I could have said some of the things that were said before, and I uh, I'm really pleased to hear Mr. Tucker's comments as well. Um, I think that in Carlsbad, uh, things are changing. Things are in flux. So as much as we do want to rush forward, uh, it was just on Tuesday, two days ago, that the city council approved a tentative map to increase density. So it's it's tentative and we, we're still doing public outreach on that. So things are changing and um, it's a little early to issue an RFP uh, because the situation is still uh, undecided and there are some variables that are still uh, moving around a little. The other thing in response to the housing affordability uh, aspect is that Carlsbad does have an inclusionary housing ordinance and we, we do require a minimum 15% affordable housing um, but for uh, higher densities, we're, we require 20% affordable housing, and that would apply to these two properties as well. So uh, thank you for working so closely with the cities. We want to work closely with you too. And uh, I'm glad to, to hear of these, these plans in progress. Housing uh, is it's so hard to build and land is so scarce. The NCTD is so lucky to have this land right there that could integrate uh, transit with it. And it's, it's just such a wonderful opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you, board member Acosta. Um, board member Rodriguez, your hand is back up. Yes, I just wanna make another last comment. Is that okay, chair? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, just wanna reiterate complete flexibility on our Oceanside properties. Let, let the floodgates open of, of opportunity and we'll work with you guys on that. Um, if other cities are not ready to go and just maybe release an RFP in a two phase approach is my recommendation. Uh, second thing is discussing affordable housing. Just want to clarify because we're all elected officials on this phone call uh, in a, a state like California with some uh, interesting housing policies. Um, number one, affordable housing is government subsidized housing meaning tax dollars are paying someone's rent or a portion of someone's rent, depending on the income level. And the state of California's policies of allocating the amount of affordable units per jurisdiction um, is not possible. It is impossible. The policy is impossible. And why do I say impossible? Because if you, if you apply for tax credits as a developer, including an affordable housing developer of four to 9%, and you go before the low income housing tax board to meet their criteria, 
the subsidy amount in the state of California for affordable housing can only accommodate about 7,500 units a year. Okay. And there's over a hundred thousand applicants. It is an impossible uh, uh, mechanism. And as local elected officials, we have to comprehend that, you know, affordable housing means we need to create housing policies that get more develops, built, development built, not rely on tax credits that, by the way, if you receive those tax credits and there's a, a land lease for 50 years, um, uh, you know, tying up the deed, uh, a, a deed restriction, anybody, even if they're from Texas, can apply to come live in your city and it doesn't directly benefit your constituents. That's the law. And so these are some variables to just take into consideration um, with your housing policies. We've updated our inclusionary housing ordinance to give the private developer, who's the one that actually builds the houses, more flexibility uh, to accommodate a, a wide spectrum of local residents, but with us taking control of who benefits, which is Oceanside residents and not the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. A little, little off, off topic of, of <laughs> where we were going with this, but um, thank you for chiming in. Council Member Gasterlin. Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, um, small question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what is the status of the Del Mar train station? My understanding is that that was, that, that the current owners, quote unquote, actually leased it and that lease is up and it will be released. Is that something that might ought to be on this list and thought about any opportunities there? I, I, I need to double check, but it's my understanding that that's not that area there, but the parking lot is not um, property owned by NCTD, but I'm happy to investigate that further. Yeah, let's check that because and it, separately from NCTD, an email came through my box talking about a lease for that property and that lease being up and or renewed soon. So it might be worth eyes on. And I might be totally off. <laughs> Okay, well, seeing no more hands raised, as this is, as this is an informational item, uh, there's no vote required. So for our next item, Karen Tucholsky, Chief Operations Officer, Support Services, Damon Blythe, Chief Operations Officer, Bus, and Graham Blackwell, Chief Oper Operations Officer, Rail, will review item 14. And excuse me as I struggle with names. Thank you, Chair Edson. Can everyone hear me? Yes. No echo? Awesome. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, my colleagues and I are pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, our topic is uh, update on personnel shortage impacts and recruitment activities for bus and rail operations. Can we advance the slides? Awesome. Thank you. So as you may have heard via various news and media sources, the country is currently experiencing a national labor shortage. This graphic illustrates how the demand for workers has recovered while the number of willing workers remains flat. Next slide, please. So the labor shortage is currently impacting the public transportation sector and transit agencies throughout the country. NCTD specifically began experiencing labor shortages with breeze operators in early spring 2021, almost a year ago and has recently begun experiencing labor shortages with Sprinter and Coaster train crews as well. Our staff are working proactively with MV Transportation and Bombardier Transportation to address these recruitment needs and try to mitigate service loss to the extent possible. So that is really it for me. I had the easy part. I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleagues to speak about their respective service areas. Up first is Damon Blythe, Blythe with Bus Operations, and I will turn it over to you, Damon. Thank you, Karen. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. Uh, next slide, Anthony. Uh, so this is just giving you a current status uh, as of uh, two days ago, um, our staffing on both Breeze and Lift and Flex. Uh, as you can see right now, uh, both of them are pretty much sitting at about 20% uh, short of where we need to be um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, 
focusing on Breeze first. We've got 12% uh, open positions. In other words, these are people that we need to hire and we can't hire for whatever reason. Uh, 3% of our hired staff is out on COVID leave and 6% of the staff is out on a long-term leave of absence. Uh, in the month of January, those numbers were slightly worse. Uh, we were at 74% available to work and our number on COVID leave was up uh, between six to 8% uh, depending on uh, you know the, the part of the month we were at. Um, so we're definitely seeing a downward trend in the number of people that are out on COVID. Um, however, during the month of January, uh, in Breeze alone, we're at uh, negative three uh, on the number of new employees. Uh, we had seven operators leave employment for various reasons, and we managed to get uh, four operators out of training. So we're at negative three for growth there. Uh, on Lyft and Flex, you're talking about a significantly smaller pool. Uh, there's only 30 operators in a Lyft and Flex pool. Uh, we're up four operators short. We have one out on COVID leave and we have one out on a leave of absence. Uh, next slide, please. So this just kind of gives you a, a snapshot in time of the last six to seven months of, of service impacts and what has caused those service impacts. Uh, so the light blue color or, uh, there at the bottom of the uh, graph represents uh, trips lost due to staffing. Uh, so in other words, we had no operator available to, to drive the bus, and so we didn't drive the bus for that particular trip. Um, to give you an idea of the, of the severity of it, uh, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, each month that we have a, the number of trips that were actually scheduled, the number of trips we actually ran, uh, and that gives you the number of trips that were completed. Uh, so as you can see, despite the loss of almost 500 trips in January, we still managed to provide 96.4% of the trips that we were scheduled to run. Next slide. Uh, so what are we doing to fix this? Uh, obviously, we need to get those 12% uh, positions filled. Um, so we've got MV, our, uh, our contractor. Uh, they've got ads on a variety of websites, including their own. Um, We've placed banner ads on our own website. You can see one there uh, to the right that links you to the MV website and uh, directs you to the, the page in Oceanside where all the driver positions are open. Uh, MV has also hired a, a recruiter, a full-time recruiter, who is reaching out to potential candidates that are looking at those jobs but not applying for them on those uh, websites and also looking at resume databases and just cold calling people to encourage them to apply. Uh, MV has also been going out to the Unemployment Workforce Centers and Palomar College looking for people to apply for those jobs. Uh, NCTD is also uh, actively recruiting for those jobs as well. And on March 10th, we will be going to a Veterans Association of North County event um, to promote not only these jobs, but also the jobs that we have open. Next slide. In addition to those uh, recruitment activities, uh, we also funded an increase in the starting wages uh, to move from 1650 to 1844 for new hire operators. Um, we've also jointly funded a new hire bonus for uh, new hire operators with MV. Uh, so that's a $2,000 bonus for a new hire operator that has no CDL, uh, and we will train you to get a CDL. And then if you have a CDL uh, existing, uh, we'll actually give you a hiring bonus of $5,000. Uh, next slide. Um, some of the current challenges we're having with that, though, uh, as many of you have probably noticed, the starting wages at a lot of other jobs in the area are close to or exceeding our current starting wage. Uh, driving jobs in particular, MTS at the beginning of the year announced a new starting salary of $20.22 an hour. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're almost $2 an hour below that. Uh, a recent search on Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon subcontracts out all of their driving jobs. Uh, we found that those driving jobs are starting anywhere from $17.50 to $19.50 an hour. Um, other jobs at this pay scale, uh, including non-driving jobs, may not require working late nights or early mornings or weekends or split shifts or holidays like our jobs do. Um, other jobs in this pay scale may not have a zero tolerance drug and alcohol policy like our jobs do. And some of the existing employees that we actually have uh, and some of the potential new hire employees are actually uh, hearing about our rail insourcing, and so we're actually losing some of our operations staff, not many, um, to the you know, open rail positions that NCTD is hiring for. Next slide. And uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Graham Blackwell. 
He's our Chief Operations Officer for Rail. Thank you, Damon. Am I being heard? Yes, you are. All right, so uh, just like uh, bus rail is not alone, private and public railroads are facing labor shortages throughout the country. Amtrak's current shortage of workers has forced that agency to focus its hiring efforts on replacing 1,894 employees across the U.S. Most of them left during the pandemic as a railroad cut its service. Amtrak not only help, helps to fill those roles, but hire an additional 865 people to help manage the expansion coming down the pipe from the infrastructure plan. NCTD's success in retaining and expanding the workforce stems from our commitment to staff, ongoing training, providing an opportunity for growth in the industry. First, NCTD did not furlough any train operators during the height of the pandemic like most operators. We did not lose a lot of the talent of our experience or trained workforce. Also unique to NCTD is a career path unlike any other in, other in the industry. A uh, potential applicant without any train experience can start as a train attendant for $19 an hour, and with time, training, dedication, they can become a train operator on Sprinter, move to Coaster as a conductor, and eventually become a qualified heavy rail locomotive engineer making 40, 30 an hour. Operators also hold dual certifications that not only qualifies them to fill vacancies, but to cover multiple positions and ensure the operation is protected. Next slide, please. So this slide represents the status of the current operations staff. Uh, starting with the train attendants on the top left, you can see we've increased our total number from 20 to 26. This is mostly to support ongoing training. 13 are currently qualified and in operations. We have six additional in training and seven vacancies to fill. Most of the vacancies come from the increase in crew sizing that we just did, and Bombardier is recruiting to, uh, for these vacancies and classes for March and April. Below that, you can see the train operators, uh, currently staffed uh, 19 of the 20 operators, but we do have an, a three additional in training to support dual certification to protect operations. On the right, you can see the coaster, where our engineers and conductors are fully staffed. Um, there is an increase of two, and they start their training in uh, February 28th this year. Next slide, please. So with the boarding increase of train attendance from 20 to 26, the larger staffing base will ensure personnel are always available for dedicated training. With the increased coaster staffing to prepare not only for expansion, but to mitigate attrition, consistent training and dual certification, it was proactively protecting coaster and sprinter service. And just like BUS, you can see we have graphics and advertising links to our web page and social media. They advertise the recruiting efforts linked to Bombardier and will fill the train attendant positions and clear those vacancies. Next slide, please. And transition, how does transition relate to our current recruiting efforts? So NCTD Rail and HR, the transition team, uh, started already, we've hosted open houses at Sprinter and Coaster Operations facilities. Uh, we presented a framework for transition and answered all the questions of the current O&M staff. We found the workforce engaged and very excited about the upcoming transition. As of now, the application period is closed and 98% of the current Bombardier staff have applied for positions. Supervisor interviews are taking place this week. Operators and mechanical staff start next week. They run for two weeks. And we hope to have all the transition hiring complete by March 25th of this year. If we do have any vacancies after that, um, we will immediately post externally and then we'll recruit and make sure they're in place prior to July 1 of 2022. Next, please, Anthony. Uh, thank you, as always. Uh, Karen, Damon, and myself are available for any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Anthony, do we have any public comments on this item? No, ma'am. Okay, at this time, we're ending the public registration to speak on this item. I see um, Board Member Contreras' hand up. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, so amongst all our different uh, modes, it, would it be our bus operators that we're seeing the most significant um, uh, I guess, is it, is that the hardest position to fill? Um, can you provide me a little bit more information on that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, just based on the fact that we have the, you know, $18 and 44 cents an hour starting wage. Uh, so we're 50 cents lower than, than, uh, you know, the train attendant position. 
uh, and the train attendant position doesn't require you to go get a CDL. We do train for the CDL. Uh, we do, uh, you know, get you the assistance in getting that CDL. Uh, but what we have seen is there are people who leave because the wage progression isn't fast enough um, to get up to something that, that people would consider a living wage or, or a reasonable wage. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would, I, in my personal opinion, bus uh, operator is definitely the most difficult to fill. Okay. Yeah, I, it just seems, you know, in, in some of the bus rides that I've had, um, our operators, they're doing a fantastic job. They have a hard job. Um, and, you know, here in San Diego County, a living wage is certainly more than $18 an hour. Um, you know, we just had a discussion about affordable housing on our, on the land that we own. Um, and, you know, perhaps there's opportunity for workforce housing as well. Um, but, uh, I think it, we need to, um, catch up, uh, to be able to, to uh, attract and retain uh, talent um, at our bus operator level. So um, it's a crucial need. I mean, if we want uh, to get to zero delay, we need to have someone operating that bus. Um, so I am in favor of uh, making sure that we are providing a living wage for our bus operators. And perhaps there's an opening uh, to discuss workforce housing on our own land uh, that we have. So uh, that would be the end of my comments. Thanks. Thank you, um, Board Member Contreras. And, and I have to say that I, I hear you loud and clear and feel much the same. Um, I have a question for Damon. Um, that leave of absence uh, percentage, for example, breeze at 6%, um, does that 6% number exceed the average percentage of employees out on leave pre-pandemic, or is it pretty standard? Uh, we've seen that number hover uh, a little bit lower and a little bit higher. It, it honestly fluctuates a little bit. Um, MV has be, been a little more aggressive uh, currently uh, than they have in the past in, in um, you know, trying to curb that number as much as possible. Uh, they've been working with people to get them back on light duty, getting them back in the office, you know, helping out with tasks where they can. Uh, so that's been good to see. Uh, it, it Honestly, you're always going to have some number, uh, 6%, uh, as, even as high as uh, we were at, at like 7 or 8% uh, just uh, about six months ago. So the number has come down. Some people have come back to work. Some people have left employment. Okay, but pre-pandemic, it could hit 6% in those days as well. Okay, so that's not a terribly unusual occurrence. It's just with with the added COVID leave on top of it that it kind of tips Right, it's, it's that additional 3 to 7%, you know, COVID leave that really makes the thing untenable. And then the fact that we're, uh, you know, we're already 12 or 13%, uh, you know, it just in open positions that aren't even filled that makes this it, you know, it's, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? We, we, we focus on one area, but really we've got to get all of these areas filled. Okay, and circling back, um, I don't think that this question is actually for you, Damon. It might be for um, Karen or for, for even for Matt. Um, uh, just kind of circling back to the comments that were made by board member Contreras. What types of next steps are we looking at to find a way to create a living wage and to attract um, uh, candidates? Is, is there something that you're thinking of? Are you gonna come back to us with some great plan? Well, um, I'll jump in here, Karen. <laughs> yeah, so th this is something that we're actively working, working on. Um, it will be part of our discussions beginning at the executive committee meeting um, as I review uh, my proposed executive director budget guidance and strategic areas of focus. Um, and so we will be making a presentation um, um, and we will lay out some of the details there. Um, and then as you know, the process is once it leaves uh, the executive committee, the board will have the opportunity to approve uh, the executive director budget guidance and strategic areas of focus, and then we will be off and running. Um, a key element of this will be discussions slash negotiations with uh, the labor union, the Teamsters. Uh, they are a very good uh, strategic partner with the district. We work with them 
Um, when I first arrived in the district was in significant financial dire straits um, to outsource bus operations. I had the opportunity to discuss some things with them today, as usual, it was a very positive discussion. But the starting point of the discussion needs to be with the board. Um, I need the board to give me a level of comfort that it, the course that I would propose that we go, that there is support from the board. Okay, and, and you mentioned beginning with the executive committee, would it then go to the PATH before it comes to the board or would it go straight from the executive to the board? It will go directly from the executive committee to the board. Um, and remember, we're not agreeing to a budget number. We're agreeing to a, 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 a set of principles at that point in time. And, and in terms of a bonding budget decision, um, that would come in two steps um, because we have been working on this. A first would, the first step would be our interim budget step uh, that we would take to make um, a potential adjustment to um, salaries. And then the second would be a broader step that I don't want to discuss at this point. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, again, seeing no further hands raised, as this is an informational item, there is no vote required. So next on our agenda, there are two closed session items. Um, as a reminder to those participating remotely, I think that's everybody pretty much, you will have to connect to the second Zoom invite to participate on the closed session items. At the end of closed session, you will need to reconnect to the regular board meeting. Lori A. Winfrey, general counsel, will take us into closed session. Um, I have a suggestion that uh, it's now 412 that we convene in closed session at about 416 and just stretch our legs a little on the way. Lori? That sounds great. So we do, we do have two closed session items today. Um, there were three originally on the agenda, but agenda item number 16 was deferred to a later board meeting. Um, so we have agenda item number 15, um, which is pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection D1, conference with legal counsel related to existing litigation, Anna Avenue Associates versus Sandag et al., the second item will be agenda item number 17, which is also pursuant to close, or excuse me, to government code section 54956.9 subsection D1, conference with legal counsel existing litigation related to the Surface Transportation Board declaratory relief matter. Okay, thank you. I'll, we'll see everybody at 416 in closed session.
So it looks like we're back. Ms. Winfrey, please bring us back from closed session. Yes, ma'am. So as it relates to agenda item number 15, there's no reportable action. As it relates to agenda item number 17, the board has provided direction to council related to continued negotiations with the city of Del Mar in an effort to reach an agreement on a license agreement by February 28th of 2022. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Tucker, you're up next. Do you have anything to report? Uh, just really quick, um, I just, I think I previously mentioned that the budget process is kicking off. Um, it will start with the executive committee and then it will go over through the next few months culminating with the board approving, a, adopting a budget in uh, June. In June, The last thing I will mention is uh, much of the agenda, a significant part of the ad uh, agenda today focused in on advancing revenue generating activities for the district. Um, this is one of the areas of focus that the upcoming budget is going to have us uh, working towards diversifying our revenue portfolio. I do want to continue to share with, board, with the board, we're on a, a very good financial footing uh, the activities that we're going to try to take are to ensure that we stay that way in the long term. That completes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's getting late, but before I ask my colleagues, if you have any items to report, I'd like to take a few minutes to share my high priority goals as 2022 board chair. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it is ensuring that we have a, a really well-functioning board we need to be focused on achieving the mission and goals of the district. And as part of the budget development process, the committees and the board will be making key decisions to prioritize capital and operating needs. I'm hopeful that we will have full and positive participation from all board members. If a board member has feedback, questions or concerns, I want you to feel comfortable in reaching out to me or to staff. Um, second, I want to make sure that the district and the region is ready to take advantage of the infrastructure bill that was passed and the likelihood of increased state funding coming from the budget surplus. I want to ensure that NCTD is working closely with our cities, the county, SANDAG, and other key stakeholders to successfully compete for discretionary funds. And uh, third, as the pandemic moves to endemic, fingers crossed, we will certainly be focused on studying and developing plans to support ridership, revenue recovery and growth. I recognize that it will likely take some time for ridership to recover from the impacts of COVID-19 and for us to fully understand what the new reality will be in terms of mobility patterns. I know that staff based on the board's approval is conducting surveys and advancing studies that will provide critical information with a focus on making no regret decisions in the short term. Finally, I wanna focus more attention on social equity and NCTD's actions related to climate change. With that in mind, I've asked the executive director to provide the board with updates and opportunities for input related to social equity and climate change throughout this year. Thanks again for electing me to this role. I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to lead such a stellar team. Let's do good things. Do any board members have anything they would like to report? Julie, do you have to my hand? Yes, Board Member Gasterlin. Yes. Um, I, I just, I want to thank this board um, for the patience and the time that this board has been giving Del Mar. Um, I do not know what happened in closed session, but, um, you know, from my perspective, I wanted to share that, you know, all, all sides have been communicating in a constructive way since January 20th. And that I think has been so important. And that has included, um, I reached out to the mayor of Solana Beach, the mayor of Carlsbad, the mayor of Oceanside, and asked them, could they please share their agreements that they have with NCTD? And, you know, they, they responded. And, you know, I, I personally, as the alternate board member for NCTD, have, have taken it on to really push to make sure that we in Del Mar understand what the other cities have done so that we're not asking for any more or any less than others have done. And I, I really hope that constructive tone will make a difference going for, forward. Um, I'm speaking here as Terry Gasterland, you know, 
board member of NCTD, talking to my fellow board members. Um, my view is that we're a hair's breadth away from being able to come to terms. And I, I really hope that we can close the final gap. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, I think- and Lori, I hope I didn't say anything that was too out of bounds. <laughs> I saw you looking at me and listening. So thank you for making sure. Well, thank you for those comments, um, board member Gasterlin and Council Member Gasterland and Terry Gasterland. Um, I think that we all hope that um, a mutually acceptable um, this agreement can be uh, put into place and very quickly. So, um, do with seeing no more hands, uh, Anthony, do we have any remaining public comments? No, ma'am. Okay, our next scheduled meetings are um, the executive committee meeting on March 1st at 11 a.m. and the regular board meeting March 17th at two. Before adjourning this meeting, I just wanna take a moment to remind everyone that today is Random Acts of Kindness Day. When we are kind, we inspire others, others, we inspire others to be kind and it creates a ripple effect that spreads outward. This meeting is kindly adjourned. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you, kind chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night.